So welcome to the Hockey Coach Podcast. This is episode number four. Today we're going to talk about habits. I'm here today again with Matt Corthius. He is at Hockey Pro Training on all social media, and I'm Kevin Muller at Kevin M2 Hockey on all social media. If you want to follow us, if you have questions for our podcast, hockeyshare.com slash questions. So, Maddie, when we talk about habits, man, there's there's so many different directions we can go with this conversation and, and a lot of fun ones too. But in terms of hockey specific habits, it's always interesting to know what some of the best players do and to just listen to what other people's habits are for how they want to get better, how they want to improve. So I'm going to kind of kick it to you right away and say, what are a couple habits that you found extremely helpful, either in your playing and or coaching days? Because I'm sure we have a mix of players and coaches listening to the podcast. So I think it's important to kind of hit both sides of it. Um, good question, Kevin. Uh, what's going on, buddy? Welcome back to another episode. I'm super fired up for this one. Um, as I was kind of thinking about this last night and throughout the week, one one real big habit came to mind and one habit that I really found to actually provide a ton of value for myself was the art of visualization. And I want to just throw a quick like disclaimer on this and that this wasn't a habit that I would do for every game, unfortunately, but it's a habit that I know once I put it into place, would just have dramatic effects on the outcome of that game. And I can remember just vividly thinking back to some big games that I played um, where I, I remember where I was in the dressing room, what I was doing, what I was listening to, and what I was thinking about before the game. And then looking at those games in particular, huge games. I played some of the, my best games I've ever played in my entire life. I'm actually honestly getting goosebumps thinking about these games right now. Like I'm talking game sevens, a couple big goals, a couple big assists, just played my best hockey and I think if you can sit there and go through what you have to do mentally before you have to go through it physically that's going to have a a dramatic effect on what happens and the outcome of the game right because if you've already done it in your mind then once you get out there it may sound silly but you can now more easily um, tap into those things you have to do once you hit the ice and once you get the puck you know what you're going to do with it once you're on the back check you know where you're going to go right so I found that to be super helpful. And like I said, it's something I didn't do every game. Like a lot of days I would just sit there and drink coffee with the boys and get dressed and listen to music and go through all that stuff. But when it was a big one and I really wanted to show up, I would sit there, put my headphones in, close my eyes and just think about my game, right? We're all doing certain things as a centerman or as a winger or as a defenseman. But that, that's just what I would do. And I found it to be super, super helpful. And I recommend to people when they're thinking about the mental side of the game, um, people will ask, well, what do I do mentally to get myself ready? Well, think about what you got to do, right? Make sure yeah. you're ready, right? Don't yeah, just throw your gear on and jump out there. It's so important, right? And if you look at, so visualization is definitely the player side of it. And if you look at the the coach side of it, if we kind of flip the roles, that's that's being prepared when you show up to the rink, right? That's having your practice plan in place. We talked a little bit about it in one of our previous podcasts, but it's having that idea of what's going to happen, right? Because then you can kind of mentally uh, just go through the check, you know, go through the check boxes and then get to work and actually and actually perform, or you know, as a coach teach or as a player execute. And that's, exactly. So it's interesting to see that one from both sides, but visualization is definitely something that uh, is a super important part of the game for players right now and, and definitely one that I wish was a bigger part of my playing career, but um, certainly the preparation side has crept into my coaching side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and as you say that, I just think I was on the ice last Wednesday with a higher level, higher level player, and I really wanted to be prepared, and I know that me and Kevin kind of talked about this practice and we went through the uh, practical practice planning side of things. So I had my drills, I had my skills, I had the stuff I wanted to work on. But even after that, I sat there the next day before the practice and I thought about, okay, now how is this actually going to play out, right? Because oftentimes what you write down doesn't 100% play out on the ice as you'd like it to, just like a game, just like it is for a coach. So I really put myself in that place of I'm on the ice, the player's there, the drill's going. Is it going well? Do I have to adjust? Do I have to adapt it? And um, yeah, you find when you get out there, it's it's 100 times easier than if you just write some stuff down, grab a coffee, get in the car, get on the ice, say, hey, man, let's get started, right? Because things go wrong. You want to be ready um, to jump on the fly. So I'm glad you you brought that up about the coaching side of things. Yeah, and 
And I think if, if we're talking about the skill side, like you just mentioned there, yeah, you have an image in your head of what that drill is supposed to look like if you pre-plan that. You have an image of, you know, what am I looking for in this drill? And one of the ones that we were talking about in, in our other conversation was, you know, you want to watch how the, how the player's starting. You want to watch how the player's crossing. You want to wa- watch how that player's releasing that shot naturally, right? So you have this vision in your mind, and you start to go play the mismatch game. Well, well this isn't quite how I wanted to see you you start so we're gonna we're gonna rewind we're gonna start right here and we're gonna work on the, those first three steps or mm-hmm. you know your crosses you're slipping on your left outside edge so we want to rewind we want to talk about weight distribution whatever that case is so it's yeah it definitely plays in in the team coaching and in the individual uh player and uh in the individual coaching as well and i think also in life when you have an idea or you're about to do something this might be this is hockey specific as well but you always have a vision of things going well, right? When you think about doing something, you're always thinking about things going well, how you want it to go. You have an idea for whatever it is. You always go to the place of, I have this idea. This is what's going to happen. Or I have this game. This is what's going to happen. But I think it's very helpful. It has been for me to put myself in a place of, how is it actually going to go down? What is it realistically? How is it going to play out? Because usually things don't play out exactly as you want them to play out, right? There's, there's trouble, there's issues, there's other people involved. So I think that's also quite helpful to realistically think about how the game's going to go down. Are you going to get that puck? Are you going to lose it? Are you going to get checked? Are you going to miss your first scoring chance and get rattled? Right? Because for me, that was a big one. I, I can remember getting a scoring chance early, especially in a big game. If I missed that scoring chance, man, I was rattled city, like sometimes for the whole game. And that, that's not what you want. You want to be able to have that scoring chance, shake it off, be pumped you got a scoring chance, and then move on, right? You can't be holding these things. You can't be holding on to these things because they're just slowing you down from what you got to do moving forward. Well, and I think the depth of your visualization actually helps you with that, right? Nobody's going to visualize going on a breakaway and having the puck hit a patch of rough ice and bouncing <laughs> over your stick when you go to shoot. Nobody visualizes that. But if you visualize the whole sequence to get that breakaway, for example – right then you know inherently that five things went right one thing went wrong there's less weight on that versus just oh i I fanned on my shot on the breakaway well life happens right Mm -hmm. hockey happens you know uh i get the question from players a lot is like what's the best foot to shoot off of the answer is whatever foot you have available to you in a game scenario and you can't predict that right so it's you're you're just training through the different sequences you're you're preparing yourself for it uh in that case physically but in the visualization side mentally you know Mm -hmm. hey I, I, you know, I made the play. I read the seam right. I caught the pass in stride. I had my head up. I knew exactly what I was going to do. You know, Zamboni driver missed that patch of ice, and it, uh, you know, it hit a bump and bounced over. So be it. And I Back think to that, work. that's almost more important than the actual visualization of the game because I've played with players that were ten times better than me. They should have been in a different league. They should have been at a different level. But why weren't they? Because they would get so mentally rattled, so mentally in their head, so down on themselves within the first five minutes of a game if things weren't going well that they took themselves out of the game easily. I played against guys where we said, you get in that guy's head five minutes into the game, he's done so. He can't handle it. He'll be, a, he'll be rattled. He'll be a baby. He'll be taking dump penalties. So not just visualizing the game, but visualizing how yourself, how you're going to feel when you get on the ice. Like we kind of talked about how you're going to feel when you miss that chance, how you're going to feel when you lose that puck because the Zamboni driver was having a nap and he missed that spot. Because it's it's huge, guys. It's really huge. You see the best players in the world. They try to probably maintain a nice even keel, right? I was going to use Sidney Crosby as an example, but he tends to get fired up, which is fine. I did as well, but he gets fired up. I think he uses that fire to drive him forward and just work harder and dig deeper. But always try your best to just maintain that even keel. Get it out of your head and just move forward. Life happens. Hockey happens, as you said. And you can't always control the outcome of every single situation. You can only control your effort. So... Visualize that positive mentality. Visualize the plays. Visualize the situations. And I think it's gonna you're gonna find that it's gonna help you um, with your overall game. Yep. And the more the more senses you can tie in to your visualization, the more powerful that becomes, right? So the the more energized you'll be if you can picture not only just the the actual vision of it, but you can picture what it's feeling like skating through the the cold air on your face and and the way your skate feels in the ice and the crowd cheering or whatever the case may be, it actually just brings more life and more energy to that visualization. 100%, 100%.
And I think that's a great thing to do. I had a coach tell me um, once to do that the night before. Start thinking about the game the night before. Don't just wake up and show up at the rink. When you wake up in the morning, especially if it's a big game, it shouldn't really matter. You should be doing the same thing for every game. But people are busy. You have school. You have this. You have that. But if you have the time to really start thinking about it the night before, wake up in the morning, go for a walk, you think about the game, you have your pregame, you're thinking about the game, you're not, not in a negative sense, you're not stressing the game, you're just preparing and you will find that your anxiety levels about the game will be lower because just like we talked about in the coaching aspect of things, the more prepared you are, the better you're going you're gonna to do once you get out there. So visualization, preparation, all kind of in the same boat and uh, I, would, I would try those things out next time you got a game in hand and I know I didn't always do it. I'm sure if you talk to a majority of players, they're still just playing the game physically, right? They're physically talented, but the best of the best are now going to add that mental side to it, and they're going to pass you by. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to jump into one of my habits here because it actually piggybacks very nicely um, with what you just talked about with visualization. And this is one that I got from a good friend of mine, Eric Hoffberg. He is currently working as a mental toughness coach for the Washington Capitals. Um, He's a good friend of mine. Uh, I think we're actually going to get him on the podcast here one of these days. So I've been been talking with Eric uh, quite a bit. But uh, one of the things that he kind of taught me and and really um, said in my head, and and I've been using it ever since we talked about it probably two years ago, is identify the moment when you get to the rink that you're in the moment. And so what that basically means is, you know, when you get to the place, whether it's your practice rink, your game rink, or you know whatever the case may be, identify that moment that you connect to that just puts you puts you in that mindset. So for me, it's the second the cold air hits my face. That's my moment, right? That's my moment to say I'm here, I'm in the moment, I'm present, I'm all in. This is my focus moment, and it's and it's funny too because like that little moment actually gets more intense in the summer because you have the difference of temperature outside so you walk in and you actually you're usually wearing flip-flops and shorts and and you get that cold air burst and it's just like that instant wake-up call to say you know what we're here we're focused we're on point this is what we're here for i'm going to do my job today yeah for me it's that smell as soon as you get that rink and you smell that rink smell that uh probably poisonous Zamboni gas. You're just like, I'm here, it's go time. You know what I mean? And I think every hockey player, coach, parent, mom, dad can relate to that smell. So that's a great point. When you get that smell, you feel that, you can connect that in your mind that it's go time, right? Your girlfriend doesn't matter. Your homework doesn't matter. And I think that's the beautiful thing about hockey is that looking back at my childhood, if you were having some tough times, you'd get that smell, you'd get that mental recognition, and you could just leave everything behind and at least – no matter what you're going through, use that two, three hours to really enjoy yourself, really push yourself, and just, like Kevin said, enjoy the moment. Yeah, it's and it's one of those things where as a coach, too, you really get to see it. Um, you know, players who have a lot going on, and if you coach long enough, you get players that are going through, uh, you name it, anything, right? Deaths in the family, you know, breakups with girlfriends, you know, pets, whatever the case may be, whatever emotion. And it's really cool just to watch that 60 or 90 minutes that they get between the glass. You just watch nothing else matters, right? Like it, they get to be there in the moment and hockey's just, in any sport, but I think hockey's a little unique because we're inside of an enclosed, um, you know, actual surface uh, with no out of bounds, by the way. So that's one of the fun <laughs> differentiators between our sport. But, you know, they just get to, they just get, nothing matters. doesn't matter if they just fail the test. doesn't matter if they have finals tomorrow. They get to be present in the moment and just like, re- like, get that stress out and be with their friends. Yeah, and I think that comes down to like another habit is just being in the moment and focusing, right? Focusing is a habit. Not being disconnected and being um, in your head, is it's a habit. I've, I've been there where my hockey career has been just going as it's been going. I've been completely in the moment. You know, something threw me off track. I had some issues, I had some problems, and then I was that guy that was, I was there, but I was elsewhere, right? I wasn't, I wasn't in the moment um, with my teammates, with the practice, paying attention. My head was elsewhere. My mind was elsewhere. I'll tell you what, that affected my game big time, big time. And it took a lot of mental work and a lot of um, just a lot of work to get back to the place where you're in the moment. You have to force yourself to pay attention. You have to force yourself to say, hey, we're not thinking about that right now. That might be a big deal in your life. That might be a problem, but we're here. This is what we're doing. It's like anything. Right? Get in the moment, focus on the moment. And eventually over time, things just kind of switch back. Where, Like you said, you walk in, you smell it, you see it. Okay, now we're here. Now it's time to go to work. Yep, love it. So we've got visualization, and we've got be present in the moment. So, Maddie, what's your what's your second habit that you want to uh, 
that you think is important to share? Okay, well, this is more of a, like a, a practical skills-based habit. And this is also something like, for, when I talk about habits, this is something that you should be trying to do as much as possible, right? Optimally, a good habit like getting up and having a green smoothie every day is something you should do every day to make sure that you, when you just wake up, bang, you just do it. So this is something I would also do on and off, but more on than off, is at least once a week, twice a week, if practice started for me at 10 o'clock, I was out there at 9.15 shooting pucks by myself. I grabbed the bucket of pucks, the lights would be off, no one would be there, some of the guys were still in school, so whatever, you know what I mean? I had that 45 minutes to myself to get out there and do it. And I found that to be very helpful, just to have that time by yourself at practice to work on some of the things that I wanted to work on. I wanted to work on my shot, I wanted to work on kind of whatever it was, right? Getting that off that quick release, because once practice starts and once the coach gets out there, yeah, you can work on things inside of a drill. Yeah, you can work on things after, but it's now the coach's time, right? He's going to do what he wants to do to get you better, get the team better. So I would advise, if you can, take 30, 45 minutes once, twice a week and get out there and put in that extra. So it's about putting in that extra work, right? And I'm not yeah, going to sit here, sorry, I'm not going to sit here and say I did this every practice like I'm some kind of a hero, but I did it enough where Monday came around that it was just like, I don't know. You, you just think a habit is something you think about without thinking about it, right? And that's what I would do on Monday morning. It's like, oh, I'm here early. Hey, let's just get dressed and get out there. Instead of sitting here and drinking coffee and talking about the girls on the weekend or the party or whatever it may be, which is also fun, right? It's also great. But get out there and use that time wisely. Yeah. And so I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. You know, let's, let's, let's sort of put this in the perspective of your, call it normal youth hockey player, yeah. right? Where you've got, uh, you know, hey, we have practice at 730 and the, you know, the, the Bantams get off the ice uh, 10 minutes before us and they flood and then we're on and we have our hour, hour 15 minutes, whatever it is. And then we're off and the Zamboni comes out and the next group's on. So, so where can we find some stolen moments? Because I like what you're saying there. You're, what you're basically saying is put in extra work, mm-hmm. right? Whatever's whatever the minimum requirement is for your team, find a way to add extra. So what's something practical that when you walk into the rink, if you're a youth player right now, you could do? Well, I'm going to go back to what we talked about first. You could take the five, 10 minutes before that practice and start visualizing practice, right? Because that, that visualization goes back to practice as well, because you'll see a lot of guys, and I've been there as well, where you just kind of, um, trying to think of a word besides what I want to use, you kind of just piss off that hour of practice you're just out there messing around your head's in the clouds you're not paying attention that's an hour you could have used to get better so take maybe five minutes before practice visualize what you're going to do at practice get yourself in the right mindset and make sure you're using that time wisely so when the coach draws up a drill you're ready to go and you're not the guy at the front of the line drill busting things and just wrecking the drill because your head's in the clouds right so that's one thing you can do. There's always stuff you can do off ice. There's tons of room at the rink where you could grab a stick handling ball. You could grab a ladder. I know a lot of guys in our team, even especially the young guys, they'd have a ladder everywhere they went, working on that foot speed. And no matter what those ladder drills are doing, they're getting, getting your mind ready for what you have to do. Your mind and your body's connecting. And so you're ready to get out there and do what you got to do. Any ideas yourself? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Like I'm, I'm the guy that says uh, almost every rink you walk into now has Wi-Fi, right? So, and uh, probably 90% of the people have uh, have an iPhone. It seems sure. like, and uh, you know, the the people that have Androids, they have it too. But there's an NHL app. Go on to the NHL app and flip on goals. Like go watch, go watch five goals, right? Mm-hmm. And, and if you're a forward, you're gonna watch habits on it. You know, it goes back to just seeing it, and, it, and it's sort of the same thing of visualizing. It's a little bit different, but it's maybe a little bit more socially accepted to be staring at your phone when you walk into a rink these days. So take five minutes, watch a couple things. And if you see something, maybe try it out. If you have two minutes of, uh, of extra ice. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just going back to what we've been kind of focusing on the entire podcast is get your head into it, right? Whatever you got to do to get your head into it. I think watching clips is great because it fired, you know, when you're at home and you see a clip, you're just like, damn, I'm fired up. You know what I mean? So it's best to do that right before practice, then use that fire to go out there and make yourself better. Yeah, no, there's that. That's a good one. I like it. And, you know, speaking of, you know, making yourself better and finding those stolen, stolen moments. One of the next habits that I have written down is shot releases. And this one drives me nuts as a coach is you watch the guys that have five, 10 minutes of extra ice time. <laughs> and Maddie, how are they shooting? Just Tell me one, the, it, one leg flamingo, just lazy, it's, right? And lazy. it's also 90% of them are off the glass. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this is a good so one. So if you have that extra time, work on your shot, take that ice, actually do something with it. And, Mm -hmm. and then I'm going to take that shot release, uh, comment on habits and I'm going to, I'm going to shift it into practice scenario. How many guys 
during warm-up drills, quote-unquote warm-up drills for the goaltenders, just spend zero effort putting quality into their shot on net. I mean, yeah. it, it's it's unreal. And I understand that, you know, the coaches a lot of times are asking you not to pick corners on the goalies. They, they want the goalies to feel the pucks, and that's important. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, so what's wrong with shooting for a rebound or what's wrong with shooting low and figuring out if you can get through his five hole from this angle or shooting off your inside step or shooting on a weight transfer shot or shooting off of a crossover or, or shooting. I mean, this is a crazy one, a backhand <laughs> I'm down. Like, yeah, it, you know, like that's, that's just one of those things again, where if you think about what do you, what do you figure, Maddie? Uh, probably take five to 10 warm up shots in an average practice each, yeah. you know, per yeah. player. Maybe, Give or take. maybe more when you're just buzzing around at the start of warm-ups and everybody's yeah. going high bar, right? The goalie's yeah. sitting there trying to get pucks out of his net and you're zigging him by his ears because your girlfriend's there. So yeah. like, yeah. I mean, Part let's just 20. say, let's just say you take, let's just say you take 10 for easy math and you have 80 practices during the year. Well, that's 800 free reps to work on a shot, right? And that's built in that you already have that ice. You're already on the ice. You're supposed to already be in the moment. So why not take that and actually get better with those 800 shots? That's a fantastic point. That's something I never noticed until um, shout out to our mutual friend Tim Turk kind of brought this to um, brought this into my mind in the into the forefront of my mind is that when you watch kids shoot the puck and now I can't stop doing this. They're all just most of them are just shooting the puck off that one leg um, flamingo snap or whatever you want to call it, right? Which there's nothing wrong with that. Every situation calls for a different kind of shot technique, but like you said take the time to learn the different shots then take the time and put them into practice during warm-ups and times like that right and it also comes into another habit if we're going to talk about warm-ups called being a good teammate right it's called doing what's best for the team and doing what be- what's best for the team is not lighting your goalie up in warm-ups and it's like <laughs> I-, I guarantee this is a worldwide problem when no matter how many times the coach says it guys don't hit the goalie in the head in warm-ups you'll still have the same guy and I could think of the guy's name right now. I'm not going to sell him out on the air. He hit the goalie in the head every other warm up, and the coach and the yeah. goalie would come out. You give him the fake two hander. You know what he said? If you hit me in the head in warm ups again, it's game over for you. And without a doubt, four games later, bing, right in his head. Right. So yeah. that's the goal. These times to get better. And what do you want when the game starts? You want yeah, your goalie got- to be ready. Right. Yeah, you want your goalie to be there for you. And I got, I got, I got two stories for you. I got to chime in on it because it's, yeah. it's classic. It's along that. I remember in college, we're, <laughs> we're uh, day before, day before playoff start, conference playoff start, right? Coach drawn up the, the, the warm up drill. Boys, hey, we got playoffs tomorrow. Like everything stays low here. We're not going to hurt the goalies. First guy, kid you not, first guy <laughs> comes down, pegs him off the, off the collarbone. Yeah, and. I've never been a goalie, but that can't feel good. No. You know, he missed no. half the practice because you know while he was trying to loosen back up. Yeah. I mean, that's that's unreal. And then the other one actually happened. I think uh, it was either last year or two years ago with uh, with my uh, with my midget team. Is same deal. We draw up the warm ups. First guy down pegs him. Goalie grabs a puck <laughs> and fires a puck right back at him. Smokes the kid in the head. The kid gets all upset, and I just look at him and I go, "What? Yeah. I go, you just did the same thing to him. Yeah. And, and I just told you not to like." Now we're even. <laughs> and of course it's going to happen from time to time. Like I'm not going to put oh, yeah. myself on blast, but I'll tell you what, I don't think I've ever done it. I really don't. Maybe my shot's not hard enough. Maybe I don't shoot high enough, but I think it's easy enough if you're a good enough player to not hit your goalie in the head. And we want to talk about visualization and mental preparation. Do you want your goalie's ears ringing going into the first period of a big game? Cause you dinged them. <laughs> or like if you get a puck in the collarbone, you're going to be a tad gun shy come game time. Yes. Right. I'm not going to be yes. a goalie. I, I shout out to goalies, but if I get a ten- right. if I get a tennis ball in the knee, I'm gun shy before the game starts. So think about those things. Be a good teammate. It, it comes down to just thinking. The habit of thinking is one that I think is very underrated and very maybe underused. I don't want to sit on my high horse here, but think about these things, guys. I, I, I sometimes wonder when the coach says, don't hit the goalie in the head, and the guy goes out and hits the goalie in the head, where's his mental preparation? Where's his focus? Where's his visualization? It can't be on the game what the coach is saying. It just can't be. No. So it's it, it it's on themselves, right? Most yes, of the time yes. it's just this is what I want to do. I want to look I want to look good to the girls that are in the stands and I want to go bar down and then you realize it's practice and nobody's there watching and yes. you know, then it's so so it becomes personal and yeah, it, it, it's always an interesting thing and uh, I guess with that I'll kind of look at my my third habit here of getting uncomfortable. 
right? And so for some guys, getting uncomfortable me actually might mean just listening, yeah, <laughs> and actually <laughs> yeah. doing what you're supposed to do. And that's but that's okay, right? Yeah. Because everybody has different ways that they process everything. And um, but man, there's no habit I think that's better than like understanding where your limitations are and where your strengths and weaknesses are. And really just trying to be uncomfortable. And I tell guys all the time, um, you know, I've been between my, my, my coaching and playing career, I've been doing working in power skating and coaching power skating for 25 years and I still fall. Yeah. The reason is I try to do stuff that puts me off balance, that puts me uncomfortable. I show you right now, my knees are black and blue because, you know, I went down, A, I was demoing some knee drop drills, but, uh, but B, I also, I also went down. That happens because I want to be uncomfortable out there. It doesn't feel real good right now, but I know that that mistake I made, I know how to fix it and I know what I'm going to do to adjust. And I know not only that, but now I know how better to coach the players that I'm working with right on that execution and what's going to work, what's not going to work. So I think it's important whether you're, whether your comfort zone, you, you should be able to push your comfort zone on skating almost every practice. That should be, that should be easy. Um, pushing your tempo with the puck, Another easy one, right? Get uncomfortable. If you're in a warm-up drill, right, you can get your feet moving. You can you can figure out that. So every drill, I, I've always said this, every drill has what I call acceleration points to it. And there are parts of the drill where it's important to accelerate or decelerate depending on where you're at in the drill. And if you understand those acceleration points as a player, and they're not hard to figure out once you think about it, right? If I make a pass, and I know I'm getting that pass back. What are you going to see 90% of the players do? Make the pass, their feet stop, they glide till they catch the pass back, right? Well, when you make that pass, that's an acceleration point, right? If you want to be comfortable, you glide. Then it's real easy to handle the next puck. You want to be uncomfortable, you make the pass, you accelerate, you sprint into that next pass. Now you're, now you're forced to handle that puck with speed. So same thing goes in for shot release, mm -hmm. right? So you have skating, shoot, you know, like there's all these different areas you could be, you could push your, push your comp. Uh, comfort zone in and if you don't push it you're not going to break through plateaus you're going to be where you're going to be the best players in the game challenge themselves and you know i was i was fortunate enough i was on the ice I, we had a pro skate here the other day that i was on the ice for and, it, it, and it's amazing like some of the skating stuff that that we work here um it, it's interesting like even guys playing at the highest level of the game struggle with that and, they're, and, it, and it, but it's great to see because they're out there doing what they're out there pushing that comfort zone so even though they may not be the best skater in the world, they're, they're playing, some of those guys are playing in the best league in the world, um, but they're still trying to get better. They're still trying to push that comfort zone every time they hit the ice. It's literally the only way to get better, right? It's literally the only way to get better. And I'm happy you said that about um, the acceleration zones. Cause we, this is what I worked on last practice with a, a player of mine. Um, let's, let's rephrase, a player that I worked with um, the other day. Sorry, I didn't want any confusion there. Um, so this is exactly what we worked on. He's a centerman, so we were kind of working on coming back in the defensive zone and working on that breakout pattern, right, where he's an option for the winger, he's an option for the defenseman coming out of the corner. And he, the first two times he did it, every time I gave him the pass, he was right on top of me, right on top of me, because he was going way too fast. And so what we did, we slowed it down, and I kind of pointed out to him, we want to start hitting our acceleration zone here. So when you get to be here, you're now getting the puck here, you're now in full speed. You can make more moves and whatever you got to do moving forward, right? So a little bit off topic, but it kind of just touched a point on this practicing we were doing the other day that that's the time to work on those habits, right? Use it wisely because come game, it's like I always say, come game time, when it comes time to make that breakout play, you've thought about it, you've done it. I actually sent him a couple of clips um, showing him exactly what I was talking about. Man, how much easier is that going to be for him once he gets out there? Yeah. Also, when we're talking about that comfort zone, I'll give you a perfect example for myself and my own skating. Is When I was younger, I would never, ever, ever push myself outside my comfort zone. Never. I was afraid of falling. I was afraid of looking stupid. Whatever I was afraid of, I don't know what it was. I, I can't remember, but I wouldn't do it. I could cross over with my right leg left underneath. Even my first few years of pros, and we had to do a simple circle drill going left over right. I struggled. I was embarrassed. I didn't want to do it. I just didn't. And it's like, I, I don't know what it is. I wish I had the mindset I had today 20 years ago where like my mindset today is if I can't do it, this is what I'm going to do every day. I'm going to figure this the fuck out or else I'm going to die. I'm just going to die because this is it's just ridiculous. But even till today, Kevin, I'm telling you, my crossover going left over right, it's like it's not acceptable. It's really not. <laughs> like I, I, I'm like, it's, it's, it's just guys, I can't stress enough. Like falling happens. 
right? It happens in hockey. It happens in life. Get used to it. Get used to it. The only way you're going to get better, right? And so the last few years yeah. of my career, I finally just said, enough is enough. And it got better. Over time, it's gradually got better. And this is kind of embarrassing to admit, but it, it is what it is. And this is the point of doing these podcasts. It's to say, don't kind of do what I did. Learn these lessons. And like, if you're 12, 13, 14, do a thousand whatever you're bad at every single day. You won't be bad at that in six months. You just won't be. You, you can't help but improve when you work on these things. So great couple points there. You triggered a few thoughts for me. So um, yeah, keep working yeah. away. That's it. It's, it. It just boils down to reps. And, and it's funny, you mentioned the left over right crossover. And I think everybody in North America, I'm pretty sure struggles at those crossovers for the simple reason. If you go to a public skate, everybody skates counterclockwise. Yeah, yeah. So it's all right over left crossover. So so what is that? That's reps. Mm-hmm. That's reps. Right. And, and you do have some, uh, you know, you, you do have some right leg, left leg dominant uh, yeah. issues inside of that, too. But, uh, you know, usually if you struggle with your left over right crossover, it's the outside edge on your right skate then that's, uh, you know, causing the discomfort, the lack of confidence in that outside edge. So, uh, but it is, it's, it's reps and that's, and that's another, where we get better. Another great point is I never even thought, it's, just, it's funny how like thinking is a habit, right? And during my career, I'll tell you, I didn't think that much. I was just a hockey player. I listened. Coach told me to do a drill. I just did the drill. Coach told me to do this. I just did it, right? I think a little bit in the moment during the play on a face off, whatever, but I wouldn't think like, why am I doing this? How is this making me better? What is the motion that's making me better? And I had a coach say to me my first couple of years of coaching, he's like, when you get the kids to do those two laps in between drills, if you're into that kind of thing for the youngsters, don't do it the same way every single time. Go the other way once in a while. Yeah. And I never, well, and, ever thought about that, ever. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, if you just blow the whistle and say two hard laps or a hard yeah. lap, they're going to go that same way mm-hmm. every time. And like, do it, do it one time, right? Just, just tell them hard left. Don't tell them a direction and watch which way they go. I guarantee that probably 90% of them will go counterclockwise because that's how they're, that's, that's how they're wired. And, and I'm a big proponent of that. Like I, I switch it up on like in te- very intentionally, but it's amazing when I tell them to go clockwise or when I, and I'll, and I'll point that direction, you'll still have guys run into each other because guys <laughs> are just like, well, I'm going to go counterclockwise because yeah. that's how I always do it. And then you see the two groups cl- coming like this and they go, whoops. Yeah. And then they finally figure it out. And yeah, it, it's interesting, but that it, it's habit. It's so deeply mm-hmm. ingrained and, and we don't even necessarily know why, mm-hmm. right? It's just everyone's, yeah, that's just how the brain works, right? Everyone's brain sort of works similarly when it comes down to like those like instinctual movements and like what you've done your whole entire life. Everyone's done the same thing. They've all gone the same direction, right? But probably not many minor hockey coaches are making them go counterclockwise. Even playing professionally, I, don't, I remember like the coach would blow the whistle, one hard lap to grab some water. We go the same way every single time. <laughs> I don't every remember time. ever going the every other time. way. What does he care? You know what I mean? Every time. No, that's it. That's perfect. And I want to cap. I want to cap this portion of it before we get into Q and A with two sort of practical. We're not going to go down the uh, the deep dive on nutrition or anything like that. But two things that you can do, two habits that you can make. Um, that are really going to improve your game, whether you're practicing, playing, you know, anything like that, uh, even recovering from injury. And, and the first one, this is one that I do every day. And I can tell you what, when it, it's like I'm in a hotel and I don't do this because I don't, for whatever reason, didn't plan it out right. It, it I feel it is every morning before I brush my teeth, I, I slam two bottles of water. So I slam about 30, you know, whatever, 33 ounces of water, 34 ounces of water before I even brush my teeth. And all that does is it wakes your body up, right? First off, it, it, it tells your body, hey, we're up, and, and it starts getting things cleaned out from the night before. But, it, I mean, you're starting your day with 30-plus ounces of water already in your body without, you know. So your ability to truly dehydrate your body uh, be, becomes a lot more, it, it's just a lot more difficult at that point. And, you know, for me, like I'm a guy right now where I'm on the ice six, seven hours a day. So it's, if I miss and there's times where you end up with a four hour run and it's really hard to get bottles of water and hard to sneak off the ice to use the restroom and all that. So if I don't have the, that good start to the day, it's not good by the evening. Like you yeah. feel the symptoms of dehydration and then, you know, with dehydration, now we're running into issues with muscles and, you know, soreness and, uh, putting yourself at risk. So that's one habit. Uh, what's yours, Maddie? That's a great tip. I'm going to add to that. Um, yeah. next level tip, throw some lemon in there, get the de- de- yep. detoxification process going. It helps with digestion as well. And if you think about that from a practical level, you're sleeping eight, nine hours, right? That means you're not drinking anything for eight or nine hours. That's a long period of time, right? You're sleeping that long? Uh, no, I have good, a kid, good so for I'm, you. I'm sleeping no, good like for five you. hours. But, uh, 
you should be sleeping eight to nine hours long. So <laughs> you wake up, you're going to be dehydrated. You're going to be thirsty. This is something I do as well. I have, didn't start doing this till later on in my life. I would usually start with uh, just a groggy cup of coffee and just get my day going off on the, the caffeinated foot, right? And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's always best to get Thanks, that Maddie. water in first, then get to the coffee because the coffee is going to dehydrate you. The pop's going to dehydrate you. Your food is going to dehydrate you. If you're eating a lot of like whatever it is, cooked food, it's also going to dehydrate you. So a lot of things dehydrate you that you wouldn't think about. So like Kevin said, starting off hydrated, it's easier to go about your day with those little tiny dehydration um, setbacks, right? Not a huge deal, but good tip. Yeah, but it could be the difference between you being oh, in the lineup sure. and not by pulling your groin as 100%, a player. 100%. Right? Especially with the seat. Like I feel it right now. I'm trapped in this back room doing this podcast. It's a little bit like a dungeon. I'm sweating. But guess what? I had some water this morning. I had a green juice. I'll be hydrated till two o'clock. I could live on a desert right now for the next five hours. I'd be good to go hydration wise. So get yourself started on the right foot. I think that's the main point there. Yep. And along Absolutely. with the uh, visualization, something that I talk about the odd time is meditation. It's kind of the same thing. And something, this is a habit that I want to talk about, uh, a habit that I want to do every day, that I'm trying to do every day, that I'm pushing myself to get into the habit of doing every day, to just clear your mind, let your mind chill out because with this day and age with the social media and the constant technology and the constant bombardment of everything, I think it's, I find myself, it's really hard to quiet your mind down. It's really hard to chill out. You're constantly thinking of things. You're constantly liking things. You're constantly dealing with comments. You're constantly dealing with people. And I think that that takes its toll at the end of the day. So start with five minutes, start with 10 minutes, just sit there, close your eyes, listen to your breathing. There's a great app called Headspace. Um, there's a lot of free uh, meditation programs on there. You can check that out. YouTube's got a bunch of stuff. You just type in 10-minute meditation. And just take 10 minutes for yourself to chill out and get your day started because you'll find, or what I find, is the more your mind quiets down, the more you're able to think about the things you want to think about, the more you're able to come up with ideas and stuff you want to do with your life. Even yesterday, I told myself, I'm going to take the morning, do a little meditating, and just put the phone away, put the nonsense away, and bam, I got 19 new ideas in my head. I'm texting Kevin this, I'm texting him that. And you got to calm the mind down a little bit. You got to get your body and your mind ready if you're looking to get to that next level. Yep. And I think it's, there's an interesting thing if, if you think about it, because so, a lot of people haven't been exposed to meditation, right? But I think a lot of people can connect with the fact that they have great ideas while they're in the shower. For sure. And what's the reason? What's the reason for it? it it's simple. Your distractions are kind of gone, right? And you have the the waters. Is, it, there's an audible, soothing, and a and a and a and a tactile feel that you know makes it uh, makes it just very relaxing. So it, it's it's sort of like that that concept. So if you're if you're turned off or scared by the word meditation, think of it in that sense. Think of it as you actually kind of do it typically when you when you jump in the shower, unless of course you're blasting music or podcast something, which yeah, every now and then you got to do that. <laughs> But, uh, you know, if, if it's just quiet, it's because you don't have your phone on you. It's your time. Nobody's, nobody's pulling at you. You're not, you, you're not forced to, to be anything other than yourself and in the moment. And that comes down to, like, stuff like recovery as well, right? The more stressed your body is, the more jacked up your body is on adrenaline and all these other things. It's, it's not allowing your body to recover as properly as you'd like it to. I can give a perfect example. I had a practice the other night. I filmed the whole thing. It went on until, like, 8.30. I came home. I was really pumped up to look at the footage, looked at the footage, started sending the kid clips, started getting clips ready for social media. Then I tried to go to bed at like 11 o'clock. Well, guess what? I was up till 2.30, right? Then my whole next day is pretty much thrown to the garbage because I'm up at 5.30 with my kid, didn't sleep. But so you got to wind down, man. That's what it comes down to. You can't stay in that jacked up state all the time. The caffeine, the, so the, the constant bombardment of stuff. You got to chill yourself out at some point. The shower example is an amazing example. I can think of a million times where I'm like, I'm just going to have a quick five minute shower, then I'm going to go do whatever. 35 minutes later, I'm still sitting in there staring at the wall like, whoa, like where have I been? But your mind's just kind of getting into that nice, relaxed, calm state. So great point there, my friend. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, that was a fun, that was kind of a fun podcast going through some habits that, uh, that hopefully we can all use to be better coaches, better players, and, and just improve our improve our game and improve our uh, status with our teammates as well. So this would be a good time, Maddie, to get into our always fun Q&A session. Let's do it. All right, so getting into a few questions here. I'm just going to piggyback on something Kevin was talking about, pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. I know that um, if I see one more picture on Instagram with like a circle that says your comfort zone and say like where the magic happens, there's another circle that says – outside your comfort zone, I'm going to snap. But it's true, right? You got to push yourself. I think the term being uncomfortable is more 
applicable to the hockey scenario. So the first question comes from Instagram. It says, I'm a senior in high school, and I always quote-unquote freak out when I get the puck. I mean that I feel like I have to make a play immediately with the puck as soon as possible. I'm not sure how to work on using the time I'm given. I also feel when I try to do something, I lose the puck, as in I have a bad puck control. Do you have any tips? Thank you. And so I'm just going to jump in on this one as I already did answer the question. I thought um, it was a decent answer. I can hear what you have to say. But the kid's basically saying when he gets the puck in a game, he gets super nervous, he panics, he gets paranoid, and he just basically throws it away. And I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate. I'm sure a lot of you guys know this kind of player. I know this kind of player. I'm sure I've been this kind of player once in a while, right? Especially when you move into contact or whatever it may be, or it's a big game and um, you just you don't want to make a mistake, right? So I think we would talk about making yourself a little bit uncomfortable. But what I told him to do was when you get into your next game or even your next practice, try to take an extra one or two seconds with the puck. That's it. You don't got to hold on to it. You don't got to do a spinorama and make a backhand sauce pass. But hold on to it to one or two seconds because like every good coach tells you, you always have more time than you think, right? Always, 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 always. So try that. Take a couple seconds with the puck and try to make it and just progress to try to make a play with that puck, right? Hold on to it. Get your head up. Make a play. And with that, make sure you do have your head up. You're looking around. You know where people are. You know where your surroundings are at. So when you do get the puck, there is no panic. If you see the defenseman's five strides back from you, what are you panicking for, right? Or just hold on to the puck for three seconds, take a hit, then make a play. Realize that it's not the end of the world, right? You always hear the term, take a hit to make a play. Well, do that. Take a hit, make a play. And I guarantee you, I can think of examples off the top of my head where making a play early in the game just led me to feeling more comfortable throughout the game. So really try to, whatever that play is, it's if it's a two-foot pass to your sentiment, if it's a chip off the boards, just make that simple play to get yourself into the game. I think you'll find that it'll help you moving forward. So just a couple simple little tips and also tips for teammates. I'm going to add this as it comes to me. Talk out there, guys. Talk, 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 talk. I see so many players that just never talk. They never say heads up. They never say chip it. They never say I'm in the middle. They never say guys right up, whatever it may be. Give your teammates help because they're going to reciprocate that help and say those same thing, same things right back to you. And when I hear guys not calling for pucks in practice, I, I just you got to call for that puck. you got to give your teammates a heads up. Even from the bench, you'll hear it on those NHL mic'd up things all the time. Guys are never stop talking. So help your buddy out. Yep. I, I love it. You know, I, and in my, in my position as a skills professional, right, like so a big part of my job is deconstruct the deficiency and figure out what the, what the root of it is. So I know a lot of guys that are – sort of panic ridden with pucks in a game scenario a lot of it has has to do with their confidence with the puck you know in in any scenario so my number one is take a look at your actual individual skill with the puck and stick handling and you know your ability to get your head up like you say read the play right like what's your ice vision look like when you're stick handling because a lot of guys when they train they they're stick handling they're not really thinking about what they're looking at and and i think ice vision is very important because you don't have to have your head up doesn't mean I'm looking straight ahead all the time. What it what it sometimes means is right. My my eye line is maybe 10 feet out, but my peripheral is giving me 35 feet out. So think about what your ice sight is when you're practicing your stick handling, right? And then if there's a spe- specific area, again back to the deconstruction side, um, if there's a specific area that you really struggle, maybe you're a wing and you're just you just have a hard time. You panic on the half wall, right? Because you, you feel a ton of pressure there, which is pretty common for wings. Then watch video. Watch a hockey game. Turn on NHL Network. Turn on, you know, your, whatever games you can see on, on TV. Watch. Watch what those forwards do in those scenarios. Watch because hockey, just like any sport, it, it's a game of patterns. It's patterns and pattern recognition. And the quicker you recognize the patterns, the quicker you can react and the better your quote unquote hockey sense becomes. So I think deconstructed from a couple different points. Number one, identify, is there a true weakness in the actual skill? And then number two, is there an area that you're specific, um, you're specifically struggling in and can you deconstruct that visually with video? I think that's a great point because if you improve those hands, you improve your ability to handle the puck. What's 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 the lack of confidence then? What's the panic? Well, that's it. It's it's not even it's not even as much the ability as the confidence, right? But mm-hmm. uh, you know, certainly as your skill goes up, ability goes up, your confidence should go up as well. 
100% agree. That's a, a fantastic point on that one. So work on those skills. And I hate to do this to you guys, but I'm going to tie this all back to what we talked about at the start, visualization, right? If you can visualize what you got to do before you got to do it, it's going to eliminate so much of that panic. It sounds silly, but it's going to work. Trust me. Just visualize getting that puck. Visualize chipping it off the wall if you're a winger. Visualize your pattern as a centerman. So when you get that puck, you know exactly what you're going to do with it. Then where's the panic? As a centerman, if you get that puck on the breakout, what are you going to do with it? You're going to skate it or you're going to move it. So if you're going to move it, where are you going to move it to? You're going to move it to your winger cutting across, your winger flying the boards. What's the play? What's your breakout? And one important thing that I know that I kind of uh, glazed over, but is figure out where you're looking before you get the puck, right? Identify that too. identify. Are are you not shoulder checking before you get the puck? Are you taking a look up ice? Are you getting that visual snapshot of what's going on on the surface first? Or are you just getting the puck because you're just dialed into that puck? Perfect. Right. So perfect. I'm glad you said that again, because I made a a quick little um, breakdown of a practice I had the other day. And the one thing I said in the breakout, I said, right, I stopped it. I froze it right when he was about to do his speed burst. I said the exact same thing you said, shoulder check here. So when you get that puck in full speed, you can just go. You know what I mean? When you guys see McDavid just do 1900 crossovers and just go, he knows where everybody is. He knows he can pick up that puck with confidence, handle it once maybe, and then just skate. He doesn't have to worry about getting cleaned out. He's going to get cleaned up a few times. That's part of the game, obviously. You're not going to have the perfect timing every single time, but nine times out of ten, he's good to go because he knows where his surroundings are at. So that's a great point. All right, we're going to move on to the next question here before we turn this into a four-hour podcast on you guys. And this is also from Instagram. They're all coming from Instagram. Instagram is the hot spot for questions. So if you guys have any questions, just feel free to fire them out my way on the DM or one of my posts, I will try to get to as many of them as I can. And this one says, I need to gain 15 pounds before the season starts. What do you think the best thing I should be eating to gain that weight? You seem to know your stuff about nutrition, so I thought I would ask you. Well, I have my opinions on nutrition. I am not an expert. I'm not a dietitian or a doctor or a nutritionist. Quick disclaimer, but I'll let you handle this one first, buddy. The quick 15 <laughs> pounds. same game. disclaimer. I'll put the uh, same disclaimer on uh, my statements, but you know, the sort of standard thing is right. Oh, take a bunch of extra protein and do do this, do that. Right. And um, I think before you go down that road, because I guarantee you probably this, this particular person's probably gotten that advice from a lot of people before you go down that routine. Number one, look for natural sources. When I say natural, I mean sources that you can get just by eating. A supplement is just that. It's designed to be a supplement. It's designed to be extra. So make sure your diet has the proper nutritional content in order for you to actually gain the weight. There are certain foods that have very high caloric value and they're easy to eat and so it's easy. If you grab a handful of almonds and, you know, again, I'm a guy that's on the ice for, you know, six, seven, eight hours a day, I got a bag of almonds right here because they're they're very good for energy. They're very, you know, it's a slow burn energy so it keeps you going through the day but they're also high calorie, right? And there's some good fat in them. And so um, look for, look for, clean sources of your extra calories and it can be as simple right i'm assuming that this is probably a kid that's in the 14 to 18 range yeah. you know it's just a, a a random guess on that but if you want to get something simple that's sort of socially accepted if you want an extra four or five hundred calories before you go to bed make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich i'm not yeah. saying that's your best option in the world but if you do that like that if that simple thing of adding in an extra four or five hundred calories before you go to bed your body will figure out how to use it your body will put it to work a couple things on that um, the first thing I told him was go for the high calorie nutrient nutrient dense foods like nuts and seeds nut butters avocados stuff like that hammer them in you can you can only eat so many nuts and seeds and nut butters until you feel like a slug I found but like a handful here and there like you said it's gonna add one to two hundred calories to your morning then add that to your afternoon then maybe add that to a post dinner snack right that's gonna add 600 calories to your day um, like we said, we're not experts on the topic. We, we all have experience with things that have worked. I've always been a skinny guy, always, always, always. It's just how I'm built, right? Everyone's got a different kind of a build. And so I remember back in the day when I would just eat anything, I would put on 10, 15 pounds, but it would be like fat. Like I'd be fat. I'd be heavy, right? So you want to make sure you're putting on 10, 15 pounds of muscle in most cases. 
unless you're a super skinny dude then you just want to put on whatever just so you're not getting knocked around having a little bit of extra weight on you is not the end of the world but you don't want it to be slowing you down so make sure you're still hitting the gym make sure you're still trying to make those strength gains because i think that's going to be um, an optimal way to do it and like kevin just said about this, this peanut butter sandwiches i got a quick story from an old roommate of mine dougie steenstra he was good friends with Dave Scatchard. I think that's his name. We're throwing it way back. Ex NHL or had a fairly solid career. He would say that he would walk around with a cooler in the summer filled with sandwiches, peanut butter and jam sandwiches. This is this yeah. this story was like I'm 35. This is a 15 year ago story I'm pulling out here, but I, I'll never forget it because I was always asking Dougie, well, how did he gain weight? He said that's what he would have in the summer. Well, those blue coolers yeah. filled with sandwiches, and he would bury them. So you're getting your peanut butter calories, you're getting your bread calories. And we talked about this a bit before. It comes down to calories. There's no real magic food, right? To Like, obviously, no. we talked about a few foods that will help, but the end game is calories. Well, it, and it's funny that this question came up because I don't think we planned this, but this comes down to habit. The, the having a cooler full of sandwiches, it's a habit. It's planning. It's preparation, right? And so many times, you know – you're not at the mercy of what mom, you're, you may be at the mercy of what mom and dad have in the fridge, but usually you're not at the mercy of them in terms of what you actually get to eat. Mm -hmm. You can spend the time, the five minutes, it takes five minutes to make two or three sandwiches, throw them in a Ziploc bag, put them in the fridge, put them in a bag, take them to the rink with you, right? Have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or a peanut butter, uh, you know, sandwich after you get off the ice. Boom. Your body wants the protein, it wants the fats, it's trying to recover. The carbs in the bread actually do help to replenish some, you know, some energy into your system. Again, perfect, perfect delivery system, no, but it's simple. And yes, that was one sort of omission from my answer. I realize now is that if you're not, if you're not training and you're not lifting, then probably ignore all the advice <laughs> yeah. and just, you know, mail it in right now because then you're, you're, the, the weight you gain will not be useful yeah it won't be useful it's just gonna slow you down and like you said be prepared and you can just you can even use those protein shakes as well if you want have a couple of clean protein shakes after your workouts if you don't have access to food right you got to get those calories yeah. in and it comes down to like anything with health and nutrition guys and this is going to be something i'll harp on till the day i die it's 100 percent consistency 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 if you eat a surplus of 600 calories one day a monday then you don't do it till next Friday, and then you're like, well, how come I didn't gain the weight? Because well, you weren't consistent. It's like people who can't lose weight. Why can't they lose weight? Because yeah. they can have a salad and a green juice on Monday, but then Tuesday was a rough day. Wednesday, um, my boyfriend yelled at me or whatever. My girlfriend, I got in a fight. And you go back to those old habits. You got It comes down to the habits, like you said. Get, get, find a way to do something every day for two weeks, three weeks, yep. right? Find and, a way. And – and start to figure out, like, I think people don't have a lot of, especially young athletes, have no real idea of caloric value in what they do in terms of exercise and what they consume, right? So if you go and train for a 90-minute skate, you may burn a 1,000 calories right there, right? And if you're 15, 16 years old, the number, your, like, break-even number probably isn't 2,000 because your metabolism's a lot higher being younger, right? Your break-even for just doing nothing might be closer to 3,000 calories for the day or 4,000 calories, depending on how you're wired. So you can't be at a 3,000-calorie minimum to break even, then go burn 1,000 calories on the ice, and then go hit the gym for another 500 calories, Right. And then consume 2,000 and expect to gain weight. It's not going to happen. You're going to lose muscle mass. You're going to struggle. You're going to get hurt, right? So understand what it takes and just Google. Google, like, how many calories does it take? Do I burn when I'm playing hockey? And you're not going to get a perfect answer, but you're going to get something close, something you can at least base your, um, you know, start to base your nutritional uh, intake on at that point. That, that is a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal point. I'm glad you brought that up. Because if you think about your summers, and I think back to my summers, it was just from 9 o'clock in the morning till sometimes 4 a.m. in the morning. Chaos, right? You're out there doing a million different things. You're running around with your buddies. You're playing hockey. You're training. You're lifting. Maybe you're partying. Maybe you're staying out late. Maybe you're, you're burning, man. You're burning calories all day long. So I'm glad you brought that up because I would have forgot. But I use an app called Chronometer. So Chronometer is an app that tracks your nutrition, it tracks your calories, it tracks your vitamins, it tracks your minerals. And for a guy like me, I'm always still trying to make sure that I'm getting enough. I'm not worried about losing. I'm trying to make sure that I get enough of everything I need and kind of nothing I don't. So with this app, you can put in your daily burn. You can put in how old you are, how tall you are, and you can just track it throughout the day. 
This is also going to come down to habits. This is going to come down to work. It's annoying. I don't do it every day now, but I got myself into a habit a long time ago where now I know what I need. I know what I get. And there's no surprises. There's no issues. So get in the habit of putting in those extra calories. Make sure, like Kevin said, you know what you're burning because you're going to be burning a lot. It's hot. Yeah. That also comes into play. And so, yeah, know what you're doing. And then just a quick personal story. So I, I, I train a guy who just made the uh, Team USA under 18 team for this uh, for this European tournament. And Ivan Hlinka, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, so it's kind of a big deal. But you know what? Here's the here's the interesting thing. He is that guy that wrote down his nutrition every day. He's not a big player. He's five foot eight. He's not a big guy, right? So at, at 17, 18 years old, that's undersized. But man, he is just a mass of muscle, yeah, right, because he pays attention to what he eats, and and it was really interesting. Um, my business partner in the gym I own back in Wisconsin uh, actually posted it on his social media the other day. It was a text exchange between this player uh, and, and my my business partner who handles a lot of his nutrition and training, and. He basically said it was it was cool. You could see the old thread, and it was it was him sending him his nutrition. It was the player sending the coach the nutrition, and he said, "Wow, that's almost perfect." Or he said, "You know, or great job with the nutrition, or something like that." The next text in the thread was just made Team USA, and you know, and the reply from the trainer was, "Wow, congratulations, that's awesome." But it's not a mistake. It's not an accident. Exactly. It's exactly. not an accident. This kid does exactly what you ask him to do, and he's seeing results. I think that'll be a, a that'll be a common denominator you will see um, in most cases, right? These aren't accidents. These things don't just happen. Just like you're not going to put on the 15 pounds just by accident. I know I've tried. It doesn't happen. It's consistency, consistency, consistency. Learning, reaching out and getting help if needed. There's lots of people that'll help you out there. Google's your friend. YouTube your, is your friend. Yep. Another you, app is My Fitness Pal. My Fitness that's, Pal. That's a free works. one. Yeah. Yep. yep. So learn these things, guys. And it's like if you're 13, 14, 15, learning them now, man, you're going to know these things when you're 20, 30, 40, when your health is really – your health is not going to be where it's at when you're 35, 40 as it is when you're 15, 16. So learning these things now is going to pay dividends for the rest of your life. So it's not a waste of time. Learning's never a waste, a waste of time. So take the extra 30 – if you're a kid, you got no responsibility. Take the extra hour a day to just do the math on these things and – it's not about being perfect. Some guy sent me a message the other day about, it's, oh, it's not about being perfect. It's about having a balanced diet. It isn't, it isn't, right? Like you'll see a lot of doctors will say that moderation kills because what is moderation at the end of the day? But the more you strive for doing the best you can, it's never going to be perfect. But just doing the best you can will get you closer than telling yourself it's it's balanced to have some McDonald's. or it's, but These things happen. Don't sweat them. But just try your best to get those clean calories in at the end of the day as much as you can. Slip ups happen, but whatever you got to do, what you got to do, right? Yep. All right, let's move on to the next question. We kind of hammered that one home. Hi, Matt. I'm 13 years old and I'm a very dedicated hockey player. I am pretty skilled and do think I can become a professional player if I keep working hard. The problem is there aren't many professional girls' teams out there. Is it still possible to become a professional as a girl? Thank you. That was the question. I thought it was a great question. question. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. There's a couple of different ways you can go down this road. Um, are there professional opportunities for women? Yes, there are. Do I think they're necessarily the best option? You know, great options for them. I mean, the the reality is, is the salary. There's no comparison men's men's to women's, right? It's uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult for a woman to earn a actual living playing hockey at this point. Um, you know, the there is there there is a new league in the states. I don't know what the options are in up in Canada or overseas, but it, it's certainly a much harder road to 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 go down. But what I would say is that um, use your skill in hockey to get a good education and become a professional at whatever you want to do. And if the answer is you want to become a professional, you know what, you can actually probably make a longer term, better career for yourself in the coaching side of the game um, on the, on the woman's side, at least that's been sort of my experience with what I've, what I've seen in the sport. Um, you know, you have a lot of opportunities to go into the collegiate coaching in the States and, you know, get involved with, with, with that side of it and run camps in the States and stuff like that. Because, uh, I'll be honest, like it's, it's a lot harder to find like a, a qualified, a quality, um, female coach just because of numbers. It's, it's not better or worse. It's just, there, there's more males playing the game than there are females. So, it, you know, 
there's there's different avenues for this. So in terms of becoming an actual professional player, there are opportunities, but understand the consequences or you know the the actual parameters. The reality of it is your salary at at this point by the time you're 20 and hopefully you know into the into that range, hopefully things change and hopefully it's a better landscape for the for the professional female hockey player. I think everybody wants to see it because at the end of the day, this is about growing our game. It's not about men's, women's, anything like that. It's about what's best for our game and. You know, I think there's there's a lot of progress. There's a lot of things that have to happen on the on the women's hockey side of it and the girls' hockey side of it for it to become a little bit closer and, and really close that close that gap between them. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And the, the one thing I said was like, you are 13 years old. You never know what's going to happen in the world, right? Yeah. I see more and more girls teams every single year. I see more and more girls playing the sport every single year. And I said, just you're 13. Keep chasing your dream. If that's your dream. Yeah. Find a way to make it happen, right? There's a million ways to make it happen, like Kevin said. Get a scholarship and go on to be a coach or get a scholarship. And I know two girls right now that are playing hockey in Sweden um, professionally. I don't know what that league's like. I don't know what the pay's like, but I know they're doing it full time from what I believe. So the opportunities are out there. And that's one thing I've learned from my career. I never planned on playing hockey professionally. I never thought I could, but I did it for almost 10 years. And it, it wasn't the NHL. It wasn't a gazillion dollars a year, but it was paid to play hockey I paid to do what I love so keep chasing that dream the world is a constantly evolving place things are always changing I know there are female professional leagues and like Kevin said as well I don't know as much about them to talk on them um, as I probably should so I apologize for that but lots of options out there keep chasing those dreams I know a ton of unbelievable female power skating coaches um, so there's lots of opportunities Absolutely. in the hockey world being a professional in the hockey world doesn't just mean um, playing in the NHL, right? You can be a professional in the hockey world, as Kevin knows, doing a bunch of different things. So you can be involved with the game on any level. So as they say, reach for the, uh, reach for the moon. You might land on the stars, and you never know what's going to happen. So just keep grinding. Don't let the state of the world today determine what you're going to do with your future. Right. This goes back to what I always say about hockey. This is not about whether or not you play professional hockey. This is about who you become in the process of trying to attain that dream. Right. It's about am I willing to do the hard work? You're going to learn about yourself. Right. You're going to learn about yourself, a ton about yourself in this journey. And you may find that by the time you're 16, 17, hockey is not really high priority anymore. You know, and that happens and that's okay, but it's about finding yourself and, and improving yourself along the way of trying to reach that goal, trying to be the best you can be. Because I guarantee you, if you're successful in hockey, a lot of those things that made you successful in hockey will work in the business world, will work in education, will work in your life. So that's that to me is the bigger picture answer to it is yeah. go for it, but keep your eyes open to opportunities that come along the way and, and pay attention to the habits that translate from hockey to quote unquote, real life, whatever that for sure, is. For sure. You see a lot of business people, they, they always want to look for hockey players because it's a team game. It's a team sport. You're going to learn that discipline. You're going to learn how to get along with others. As Some people still don't learn that, but you got to just do your best to uh, take advantage of the opportunities you've been given. And if you can use hockey to benefit yourself and you still love doing it, grind away, my friends, grind away. There's always a way. I know guys that are 40 years old, they're still playing professionally because they love it because they found a league that'll pay them to play. And I don't know. Hockey is a vehicle that, if used correctly, I think is is a beautiful one. So, keep going. That's our advice. Keep going. Find a way to make it happen. Yeah. Any great, other questions you want question. to get to uh, today, Kevin? Or are you good? Nope. I think that about wraps us up for uh, episode number four on habits and everything in between, yeah, as I think sure. we uh, we normally end up. And it was a lot of fun. But again, yeah, if you have questions to submit to us, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, HockeyShare.com slash questions, or you can. Uh, DM myself at Kevin M2 Hockey or Matt at uh, at Hockey Pro Training. Uh, those are good ways, simple ways to get to us for uh, for question submissions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can on every podcast. Perfect. Yeah, that was a good one. If you guys are looking for more information, you can hit up HockeyProTraining.com or HockeyShare.com for practice plans, video drills, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, and we will see you guys at the next episode. Bye for now.